the uh, next presentation is on a very different aspect of uh, environment. And I think you will uh, have to pick up a, a bit of a link from what uh, Hannah was saying. Um, her, the second finding was, uh, was about um, contamination of gloves, and that I think provides a useful link to uh, Ebola and uh, the risks there. So we're going to ask um, Professor Keith Neal, who's an uh, emeritus professor uh, with Public Health England, who has recently returned from the Sierra Leone, I understand, um, to do the next presentation. Thank you very much, Chief. I presume we, we might tap on right. Right, Ebola. <coughs> um, many of you won't have heard of this beforehand, but I had the fortune or misfortune to work in one of the high security infectious disease disease units in the past, so I would have some experience of what we would have done had we had a patient, but fortunately we didn't even get anyone. We had a few scares, but they never turned out to be real. So I'm going to cover a few things from the virus. Where do we think this virus comes from? Past outbreaks, what have we learned, if anything? This outbreak, how does it spread? Some clinical features, how we test for it and how that causes how we manage it in this country. Infection prevention and control, vaccines and the future. So, <coughs> it's not the only serious hemorrhagic disease. There was a group of serious hemorrhagic virus diseases, of which Ebola is one. And there's actually five different Ebola viruses, which we'll come to. Um, it's thought to come from bats, although I have even seen people think it's a plant virus, and that's how the bats get it. Certainly, chimpanzees do get this and they die from it. Another one you may have heard of is Lassa fever, particularly common in northern Nigeria from, from feces and urine from the multi mammate rat. The one, and I've got a dreadful spelling mistake there, probably Putin will shoot me down for the spelling of the wrong, but the Congo, the Crimean hemorrhagic fever is a tick borne disease, um, not like Lyme, which is a bacteria. But it is in the Balkans and it is through to Pakistan. And as we have lots of people going on holiday to these areas, and we actually have very little back, it is actually a very serious infection and certainly caused problems to the British Army and how to isolate potential cases during the Yugoslavian Civil War. So the British Army has got quite a bit of expertise, although they seem to have to reinvent it for Kerry Town. The five Ebola viruses are basically Ebola is the name of the river and the in the middle of Central Africa, but there are the Zaire strains, the Sudan strain, the Thai forest, the Wundubugu strains, which are all in Africa, and another ancient, Reston, which has come from the Philippines island of Mindanao and affect monkeys. And is named Reston because it, these monkeys were imported into America through a holding facility, Reston, because they were quarantined after the Marburg outbreak in Germany, which infected several lab workers also known as green monkey kidney problems. The arena viruses, there's quite a few of those. Lassa fever, lymphocytic chorium meningitis virus is probably the one most commonly you may have had and might never known about it. It's spread by pet rodents and rats, and it's the only time I've ever come across it as a problem is with pregnant vets phoning up, up get being worried. But it can cause them a viral meningitis, which is different from bacterial meningitis. And there's various other hemorrhagic fever that have been spread around the world. And then the Bunyu viruses, CCHF, and Hantavirus, which you may have heard of in the press with various authors of literature through your institute with the infected rats. We've had a couple of episodes in the last two years. So, what sort of virus is it? Well, I did make the joke it wasn't even a poxy virus, and nobody really got that, so I can explain it. <laughs> Pox viruses are tough. That's why we use vaccinia for a lot of research purposes. This thing is easy to kill. Um, it's, it's an envelope virus. You just drop the envelope, it dies. And it's a single strand of RNA, which means it mutates a lot and is not very robust. The problem is, when it does infect somebody, there is a severe disease with a high case fatality. And we have no specific treatments at the moment or vaccines that are effective. We've had 20 outbreaks in the past, and uh, this one is caused by the Thunder strain, and the other five we've mentioned. And there's some nice scanning electroscopes 
but essentially it just seems to be a long, curly, thin or strand with a blob on the end. A uh, list of outbreaks in the past um, with various cases, largely mainly coming from Sayer and other parts. <coughs> this outbreak almost certainly has been spread for a long period of time. And interestingly, one of the early outbreaks of Ebola, where they collected the blood, they actually went past and tested for HIV back in the 1950s, although Ebola wasn't recognised. There was a 1% prevalence of HIV in the population at the time. And there is a certain similarity with HIV and Ebola of how they get into the human populations. On the left, we have something saying bush meat. Okay, exactly what joints are on the left of that table or not, but you can recognise a primate of some form. And the Ebola viruses are spread in the black ones depending on the size of the type of animal. So they are geographically distinct. The one in Johannesburg was actually a Swiss vet who did a post-mortem on an animal in the field. And because it died, and the chimpanzee had died of Ebola and she caught it. Because that's actually quite an easy way of doing post-mortems in the field are not easy. So if a, if a vet doing a post-mortem can get infected from an, a dead animal, then you can easily see how trying to butcher a dead animal you find in the forest for protein is very much easier with blunt tools. So you're certainly hacking off bits for the joint. is a lot less careful than a field post-mortem. This is the biggest Ebola outbreak we have seen. It is also a number of other features that may have made it big, but partly the countries affected are particularly poor, they have poor health structures, and it's the first time it's really hit an urban area. If Ebola occurs in, say, Uganda or the Democratic Republic of Congo, somebody brings an infected monkey in, they butcher it, they eat it, it spreads, few people get ill, and then it's sort of limited spread because it tends not to get out the village unless people travel for health care. And by the time you get Ebola, you're not really very fit to travel. And unless you're sort of being taken by boat, then it's unlikely that you'll actually get to help. So it doesn't ex the outbreak does not explode. And that's just showing the patches most affected. Liberia and the Sierra Leone, so it's going up to Guinea, and now into Mali over the border, which is off the side. So what do we know about Ebola's initial outbreak? Well, there are lots of diseases that give you fever. Now, even in this country, flu, flu, or cold, or anything else. But in Africa, you get malaria, typhoid, and, it's, and put loads more rather than boring you with lots of differential diagnoses. So you come in with a fever, and the interesting thing is you think they've got malaria, give them anti malaria and see if they get better. In the absence of, you may even do, if you're in a more advanced sense, you might actually do a blood film. Take a finger prick, look at it under a microscope. You can immediately potentially expose the healthcare worker to blood. And it's caring for these people who are highly infectious, either in the household or as healthcare workers, that causes the initial expansion of the epidemic. And it's healthcare workers in particular have borne the brunt of this before it is realised that you're in the middle of an Ebola outbreak. And then there's been social factors. I mean, how many of you regularly shake, how many people have you shaked hands with today? Five? Well, they sort of, this was also even more common in Africa. So we actually had been there, you, they invented a new gesture. Sort of taken from the Romans, sort of like, you certainly go like that, so you don't actually have to touch anybody. So that's actually changing behaviour. But I'm not sure how that is going out. That was certainly in Freetown, where people have been educated people. There are people still <coughs> denying Ebola exists. Um, and then there's a grieving and burial process, fuel and epidemic. The, infect, the dead body is highly infectious. Um, it's called a hemorrhagic disease because you bleed. But in most of this bleeding is oozing from mucosal surfaces, so it drips out the nose, the mouth, the ears, and other orifices. So you wash this, and therefore you're exposing yourself. And who hasn't got cuts on your hand? If you're in these, we have far, far better systems for keeping our hands clean. We have plasters. Out there, you're far more likely to get knocks, so they've got cups and fingers, so the people washing them get it all. And they're also holding the dead, holding the dead bodies after they've died. They're all part of the social culture, which is incredibly difficult to break. 
How, I mean, we all know smoking is dangerous in this country. People still smoke and even start smoking. So even people are educated, there's issues about keeping so. This apparently is as far as the outbreak has been traced back. Emil Iwano, who was a two-year-old in Mali, who had come over the border to be, and that is the family chain. It goes through the family, and then it into the village midwives and nurses, and then it explodes around. And that is, once it's sort of the doctor and then his brother, it just can explode very quickly in a very short period of time. And once these people start getting into healthcare, the healthcare workers get ill, they take it home, and until you know what it is, and there is a lack of diagnostic tests, even trying to diagnose things in this country has caused problems, in that we have a suspected case of Ebola where the malaria test was initially negative, of course, no one panic until the malaria test was repeated and found to be positive. <coughs> In a sense, each outbreak is separate, because these countries are quite separate. And even, you've got the cases of Guinea. Liberia seems to be showing a reduction in the number of cases, and this is probably real. There has been reporting issues, particularly in some countries, in Sierra Leone, some of that data at the end is a reporting issue. But even then, across these different 14 sort of sub-districts of Sierra Leone, there are high-level transmission in some and one or two chains of infections in others. <coughs> it appears that an outbreak chain can start and then die down with control. But certainly in the more concentrated areas of Boko, Boko, Lo, Loko, Loko area near Freetown, and Freetown itself are still having a large number of cases per week. And these are underestimates because not everybody ends up into the system. People are, for various reasons, people do not get done or there are diagnostic delays, and these are confirmed cases only. So if you die quickly without being tested, you're only suspected. So, what do we know where it comes from? It's a zoonotic virus. And most of our new diseases we have are zoonoses, and by that, it's, an, it's, a, it's a virus or a bacteria that lives normally among a population of animals, and then spreads over to humans. HIV, almost certainly there's reports of, if you look on the BBC website yesterday, with World, two days ago, with the World Day Day, documenting the trans different transmissions from probably three times from chimpanzees and once from gorillas. HIV, too, is from the sooty mango people. Flu is a poultry disease, often wild, wild birds, and then can spread, although we can quite happily sustain flu ourselves. The changes in flu may come from kids or anything else. So you have this spiller over the event, and it appears that the fruit bats, there's two ways it is suggested it gets into the human food chain, in effect. And if one is bat moth, where the bats damage the fruit, so it's their saliva, or distant saliva, or the monkeys get ill because they eat the fruit and they die, and then they get into the food chain. And then it's amplified between human and human. And most outbreaks occur in remote areas because there isn't any sort of flying fruit bats in, in the urban areas. <coughs> so our outbreaks are definitely full of apes and monkey deaths and bushmeat. I'm sure that's, that's not come out very well, but essentially the bats, it, it's a best one. We don't know whether it made the bats ill or not. The likelihood is it doesn't cause serious infections in bats, otherwise they'd be large water, and it's not bats die, but they have a short lifespan of bats anyway, so finding a few bats there would not be unusual. So the bats then get into the animal food chain and then spread to the humans and the sample time. What is infectious? Blood and other body fluids. We talk, if the question is how transmissible sweat is, because that seems to be the one that causes great concern, and sweat is probably not very infectious until you are quite ill. So if I was incubating Ebola, because I've come back from Sierra Leone, and you shake my hand, you are very, I don't know the temperature, so I'm okay, that you probably would not spread it. If I vomited on you with blood or bled on you, that would be serious, but they are late phases. In the sense that Ebola will spread by contamination of blood, but you've got, so if you're a healthcare worker who gets a needle stick injury or takes blood without wearing gloves and gets contaminated or get handled with 
blood in the lab, you can get contaminated. Certainly, if you're living with somebody early on, you obviously get a much higher level of exposure if you're caring for a child or your partner or an older relative, there's a greater chance of transmission. Let me say to you, up. Infected animals, I think, certainly there have been episodes of dogs showing Ebola antibodies following Ebola outbreaks, and that's probably from scavenging dead people and, because they're not getting buried. They don't seem to get ill, which would not be on why they don't get ill. Um, you do need direct contact, and that's either with alive or dead people. So, a lot of things like flu, you really do need to be a living to spread it, because unless you're doing a post mortem forage, you're not going to get aerated. It is not airborne, fortunately. There's one thing that would keep you awake at night in my job of trying to stop outbreaks would be an air airborne form of Ebola. And I don't want to scare you, but there is one. The rest of agent in, which was from the Mindanao Island in the Philippines, which affected the monkeys in the holding centres. There was evidence to support airborne transmission, but it's just as likely it was direct contact between the animal handlers. But it doesn't make people ill. So the jury is out on whether the rest of it is actually airborne transmission, although you may read somewhere that it is. That is far from guaranteed truth. You wear masks to stop things splashing on your face. Um, I was involved in trying to look at the rate. We had a problem by luck in University of Nottingham that we had to school with large numbers of students getting cryptosporidiosis in the cow hand, in the calf handling practical. As you're probably aware, calves get scours, scours is cryptosporidiosis, millions of cysts disappear into the bedding and onto the cow, and you don't need these to get infected. And watching people and going like this, and the number of times you're touching your face, you don't know you're doing it. And it is very common. So, if you get it on your, so the mask is there to protect your mouth. This is one of the issues that is debating is whether to use masks or visors. And the, I personally think the visor is more important because not only does it cover your face, but it separates the face from contact, unless you're completely suited up. You can use goggles and a visor, but the visor has the advantage as you know you've touched your face. So you sort of go like this and you miss contact. A fragile mucosa is particularly around the eyes, the mouth, and everywhere else. Um, infections only when symptomatic, fortunately, and we don't know how the worst how high you have to be to be really significant. Household contacts appear to have a three to seventeen percent attack rate. Although it probably depends what the state of what your type of contact is. But certainly on the getting people in what living in single rooms, you get a lot of contact. It is sexually transmitted, I put it there, but we don't know for sure. The only evidence was a similar virus in Marburg where a laboratory worker infected like 82 days after transmission. She survived quite and it was a mild infection. But it is certainly found in genital fluids. So if you get Ebola, no sex for three months. Um, so through broken skin and blood and body fluids, it is in breast milk. So that's probably what else do you feed your child? Um, and needles and syringes. Importantly, you're only infectious when you're you only contagious when you actually got symptoms. So spotting ill people is a trick, and you get high loads as you get ill. Ebola, what does the Ebola virus do to you? Well, basically, a lot. In direct infection of tissues leads to cell death. It's, it disrupts the immune system, which means that you are less likely to beat off the infection. One of the things that is a well recognized is that those people who make antibodies early have a much better survival. And so that's where the antibodies start to activate the virus before it turns off your immune system. Which is useful, which means that it's very likely that a vaccine that is able to induce antibodies in advance is likely to protect. And the fact that you can survive, and the various, some of the other treatments have been suggested and used, are actually in fact, to be acting like antibody-like. <coughs> um, 
one of the things it causes, because it causes a lot of cell death, particularly in the blood vessels, you leak a lot of fluid. So you become, you, you essentially lose blood volume. You go into a sort of shock, hypovolemia. So fluid maintenance seems to be a key, is about the only effective management we have. And interestingly, it's difficult to maintain. We can maintain fluids in this country because we can just pull another litre or two off the shelf. I can remember once somebody took some a quinine tablet who was allergic one night and we put in 32 bottles of plasma. The trouble was that it was dialyzed and taken off the next day because it was fluid overloaded. But it was easy to survive. So we have volume replacement. It's easy. You get a drip in, and there are various places you can put drip in if they've got no blood veins, you just go down to the clavicle. And you can just run through it, and that seems to improve survival substantially. The death rate, mortality rate from early, very few of the people who have been flown out of West Africa to a Western country and have been treated early have died. The, the man from Liberia was treated late and was running around ill. The Spanish priests were evacuated late. There have been large numbers of people ship, sort of evacuated out early. And very few of them died, if any. So get, get your fluids in early. That's very simple treatment for this country or any other developed country. Fluid balance and electrolytes. You can get into a septic shop and you can get deep disseminated intravascular population, which means you keep, of course, it's the bleeding, which is why. But we actually can help turn that off. You actually make, you can actually give a good drug that helps people bleed to turn this off. It sounds counterintuitive. Doesn't work. This is detecting the fluids of Ebola during the acute phase. <coughs> Clearly, the main issues there, the darker colours, the viremia in the blood. It appears in saliva, but if anybody has ever brushed their teeth, you will notice it's very, if you've got a bit of gum disease, you can get blood quite easily. The other thing is if you actually do just sprinkle saliva around in your mouth, and if you've never had urine dipstick from you can get these dipsticks for in urine, and you spit on one of those, and you get two plus of blood. That's how sensitive. So saliva is partially contaminated with blood. Urine remains infectious, but tend to be able to avoid urine. Tears and conjunctiva, particularly early on. Skin and sweat seems to be only early. Raccoon feces, again, they shouldn't be a problem at risk. You tend to be able to see those. Breast milk, interestingly, it only becomes an issue it's already been tested as you're getting better, and the same for semen, and we believe, and the same for shining fluids, which is why you have to make these are risks. So clearly, blood, urine, and other factors are the main cause of risk. So acute onset, typically eight to ten days after exposure, but be anything after two to twenty-one days. You start with basically fever, chills, mild, malaise, anorexia, which could be flu. Out there they call it malaria. And then after a few days you get increasing symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, and then your headache and other factors. Hemorrhagic symptoms are only in one in five cases. And clearly there is plenty of other diseases out in these countries that can cause this, and even more likely to be something else in this country. You can get non-specific features, which we talked about losing blood volume. Um, Non-fatal cases tend to start getting better within the six to eleven days after symptoms. <coughs> and fatal disease associated with more severe which is not unusual. Um, fatality rates of even 90% have been reported. Intensive care, all the other things that we take for granted, increase the survival rate but aren't deliverable to many people. We would struggle to treat a number of people. In, free time in this country, and our population is 10 times bigger than Sierra The number of different features of the disease. I did originally, when I quickly looked at this quickly, thought somebody would put some smallpox slides up for me, but it was actually the R features <coughs> of the both virus disease, particularly got the bleeding into the skin and the hyperbolemic shock. The black fevers, we've got gangrene because of blood loss of blood supply. Bottom one with the on the right, the bleeding from the mouth where the site of bleeding. 
as I said, the survival, the sooner you make antibodies, the better. And it appeared, well, you can actually show neutralizing antibody up to 12 years after infection, which what we don't know is whether you can get it in Ebola again. If you've had it once, can you get it again? Logic detects that every other virus disease we know about, if you do get it again, it's much milder. But nobody's actually tested this theory, and it'd be very difficult. And if one person did get it again, and it was very mild, that would only confirm things. There were other questions if you had one strain of Ebola, are you protected from the others? Because we just don't 